Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and as uh, Laura has said in her introduction, uh, where we will be talking about uh, residual stress and material science in manufacturing. My name is Stuart Laidlaw, uh, and my colleague uh, David Easton will be presenting uh, shortly on the technical content. Um, but first of all, uh, I, I will go through uh, a couple of introduction slides. And firstly, just like. Sorry, Stuart, just had to mute you there to turn everybody's microphone off. Could everybody please turn off their microphones and their webcams? Thanks very much. Sorry about that, Stuart. That's OK, no problem. Uh, that, that comes in nicely to the housekeeping. So just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded um, and will be, will be made available on our YouTube, YouTube channel later. As Laura has said, um, your microphones and webcams will be turned off during the session, just to avoid background noise. Um, and please, during the session, if you can make use of the chat tool and uh, type in uh, your questions, um, and uh, we will make use of them uh, and do our very best to answer them um, at, at the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you can also use the hashtag NMIS Insights for any questions on Twitter, uh, that would also be uh, well received. And finally, if you can please take some time to complete our survey, um, that will be sent after the webinar, and that, that will be um, very useful to us for, for the future. So, what is the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland? The National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland is a group of industry-led manufacturing research and development facilities where research, industry and the public sector work together to transform skills, productivity and innovation to attract investment and to make Scotland a global leader in advanced manufacturing. What will ENMIS do? Well, ENMIS will increase productivity by reducing barriers to innovation stimulate investment and increase manufacturing competitiveness, catalyze job creation and strengthen supply chain links, inspire and attract talent and equip current and future workforces with the skills they and business need, and to work with manufacturing businesses of all sizes in multiple sectors, providing benefit to the whole of Scotland. So, the One Scotland team, uh, NMIS, is operated by the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and supported by a number of organisations, including the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, Renfrewshire Council and the Scottish Funding Council. So. In terms of the ENMIS group, as you can see, there are a number of elements to the ENMIS group, and it is a growing um, group. And at the moment, in the yellow area, um, we have our specialist centres that are open now, and uh, the AFRC and the LMC are the specialist centres which have been delivering industrial scale manufacturing focused research for a number of years. In the case of the AFRC, we have been delivering such projects for over 10 years, and we were delighted when uh, the LMC opened at the beginning of 2019 and has been de uh, delivering uh, similar projects in the areas of lightweighting and uh, non-metallic materials for, uh, for the last 18 months or so. We also have in development um, our outreach activities uh, within the NNIS network such as industry bodies, councils and academic institutions around Scotland, along with the development of temporary workspace, which will help us facilitate the early stage NMIS projects. The Digital Factory, the Collaboration Hub and the Manufacturing Skills Academy facility is being built near Glasgow Airport and is expected to open for business in 2022. However, we are not waiting on the completion of this facility before we start. So, for example, we are already delivering digital additive manufacturing and automation projects 
from our teams that are currently housed in the AFRC. And of course, as we obtain uh, our temporary facilities, we will be able to expand that uh, whilst we are waiting for the new facility to be uh, built um, and opened in 2022. Okay, so with that short introduction, I will now hand over to my colleague, David Easton, who will present to you our capabilities and uh, knowledge and uh, uh, facilities in uh, material science and residual stress. David. Sorry, David, could you try your microphone? That's your microphone on for you, David. Uh, sorry, That's I think, you. I think uh, you muted me when you muted everyone. Apologies. That's you sorted. Not a problem. Uh, let me just. OK. So. Yeah, I'm David Easton. Um, I'm a Materials Knowledge Exchange Fellow at the Advanced Forming Research Centre. Um, as uh, Stuart mentioned, this is a specialist uh, technology centre and um, part of the NMIS group. I've been here for five years and I currently lead the residual stress measurement theme um, here at the centre. I did my undergraduate with Strathclyde in aeromechanical engineering, um, and I also did my PhD with Strathclyde in Culm Centre for Fusion Energy. So I'm a long time member of the Strathclyde family. Today's talk, I'm going to cover a bit on the background of residual stress, sort of some of the, the fundamentals. We're going to look at the origins of residual stress within a manufacturing environment. I'm going to talk about what impact um, residual stress can have on manufacturing and manufactured components. Um, we'll look at the approach that we take here at AFRC um, in terms of residual stress research and what capabilities that we have to offer. And then finally, look at some case studies so where these capabilities have been applied to solve um, an industrial problem. So, what is residual stress? Definition would be residual stresses are those which exist in a part upon which no external forces are applied. So it means that if we have a component sitting there on a table, internally there are going to be these these forces, these stresses, you know, that are looking to, to push and pull and, and twist um, the material um, from internally. We're not talking about, you know, anything acting on the component. So that's what residual stress is, but what does that really mean in the world of manufacturing? I hope by the end of today's talk, you know, you've got a, a bit of a deeper insight into what this means. Residual stresses are everywhere. They exist within all real manufactured components. These stresses are locked in and they evolve throughout the manufacturing process. Every time we do anything significant to our material, and when we're manufacturing it, we're likely changing its residual stress state. They can be detrimental. Um, for example, tensile machining stresses can um, negatively affect fatigue or corrosion. We can get distortion coming in from residual stress. They can also be beneficial. I mean, for years, compressive residual stresses have been intentionally induced um, using peening um, because we get better fatigue performance. And in some situations, they may not have any significant impact at all. But what is important is that we as designers and engineers, we understand what the residual stresses are, um, how they are in our material and what can happen um, if we don't take account of them. So stresses, they can be sort of categorised as tensile or compressive. Um, put quite simply, tensile stresses are looking to pull the, the part um, apart, compressive stresses are looking to sort of squash that region of the material together. They're self-equilibrating. So this means that when we look at a part on the whole, 
the average stress has to equal zero. Um, otherwise, the part would be moving um, in accordance with, with Newton's laws. And it's this self-equilibrating nature that's important, um, and this will become clear later on in the talk. Residual stresses come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and can be categorised as three predominant types. Type one being macro scale stresses. So these are the sort of scale that we see on real manufactured components. So these are sort of big and they act over the whole length of a part. We have type two stresses. So these are intergranular or mesoscale stresses. So these act on a sort of grain to grain basis. We can measure these um, and these do have some impact, you know, when we're talking about real sort of engineering situations, but less so than type one. Type three is very small. So these are the, the sort of small stresses that exist within a single grain on an atom to atom scale. And these are typically sort of outweighed by the other types when we're talking about manufacturing. You can see a, a depiction of this in, in the image on the right. At the top, we've got our, our macro scale stress acting across the whole length of the part. And then we've got much more local variations on a, a grain to grain basis with our type two and type three. So today, the, the focus is going to be on these type one macro stresses. Residual stresses can be caused by all sorts of, of factors, but it basically boils down to a geometric misfit of some sort. A region of material being forced into another region, you know, where, where it doesn't want to go. This can be induced, you know, thermally, you know, it can be mechanical, it can be all sorts, but that's really what causes residual stress at the end of the day. And we'll move on to talk about how these are, are um, induced sort of in real manufacturing terms. So I've mentioned mechanical factors. So if we take a metallic material and deform it beyond its shield strength, it's going to cause non-uniform -plas non plastic deformation. The part's going to be stretched and it won't return to its original shape. This will cause residual stress. And we see this across all the sort of major um, forming technologies, forging, forming, surface treatments like pinning and deep rolling, machining, all of these are going to introduce sort of mechanical residual stresses. We have thermal factors, heating, um, cooling. So if, if we take, for example, a part being quenched as part of heat treatment, we're going to get heating and cooling at different rates in the part. This is going to cause temperature gradients. Different regions in the material are going to want to expand or contract differently, and this will result in residual stress. Similarly, chemical and metallurgical features, things like phase transformation, or things like transformation plasticity. This can arise in residual stresses. When austenite transforms to martensite, you know, the, the volume is different and this is going to introduce stress. Quite often manufacturing processes will introduce at least one and more likely two of these factors. Forging, for example, we have a mechanical influence here and we have a thermal influence on cooling. Forming, we've often got very high levels of deformation, severe plastic deformation, um, in order to shape the part as we want. And the result of that is residual stress. Machining. So machining and residual stress are very closely interlinked. Whilst machining itself can cause residual stress, um, the, the process itself can, you know, um, impart stress in the part. What we see quite often is that when we machine a part, we are releasing residual stresses that already exist and cause distortion. So we'll talk about this in more detail later, but anyone with a machining background is going to be familiar with the distortion problem, and that's thanks to residual stress. We have heat treatment added to manufacture. So this is uh, another great example of where residual stress has to be sort of considered in the manufacturing process. Additive manufacture is a very exciting technology. We can quickly and efficiently build complex parts um, that would take you know, much longer or be much more expensive to do otherwise. But because of the nature of the process, we are introducing high levels of heat, um, quick cooling, and that's inevitably going to lead to residual stress 
So if we're not careful and we don't consider the effect this is going to have on residual stress, then although we get the shape we want, we might not get the performance, you know, compared with the conventionally manufactured part. So residual stress plays a big role when we're considering additive manufacture. Surface engineering, I mentioned previously, this is where we are intentionally um, introducing residual stress in order to, to get some sort of benefit, whether it's fatigue or, or corrosion. And welding. Welding is a technology we see across all sorts of, you know, manufacturing environments, all sorts of industries, um, and inevitably it's going to lead to residual stress. We have very high heat input. Um, we can have dissimilar materials, the parts going to heat up and contract, and that's going to leave behind residual stress. Depending um, on the situation, depending on the application, we may need to address that. So to recap, residual stress, it exists in all parts. It's self-equilibrating, so it averages to zero um, across any part. It's modified in some way by all the major processes that we encounter in manufacturing. It acts across all sorts of scales, whether down at the atomic scale, at the grain level scale or the macro scale, and all sorts of factors, mechanical, thermal or chemical, um, are going to affect the, the final residual stress state. So that's where residual stress comes from, but what does it actually do? What impact does it have? on our manufacturing or our components. Well, it has a significant impact on many different critical performance characteristics. We can sort of see here in the diagram, just some of them listed, and um, fatigue being an obvious one, corrosion, fracture, tensile strength, dimensional stability. It really can have a part to play um, in a lot of these, uh, these material characteristics. Tensile stresses, of course, um, can have a detrimental effect on fatigue and corrosion. Compressive, you know, can be uh, conversely beneficial. Any residual stress, whether you want it there or you don't, whether it's tensile, whether it's compressive, can cause distortion um, during manufacture, whether this is during machining or whether it's a change in the, the dimensional stability during the lifetime of the part. And we can see here just some examples of, of what residual stress can do. Here we've got a flow formed um, tube, which experienced extremely high residual stresses and enough to actually cause it to fracture. Or we have um, some corrosion material where the corrosion has been exacerbated by the presence of tensile stresses. So impact of residual stress. I've talked about all these sort of things that it can affect fatigue and distortion. It's important that we understand what it's going to do if we're going to know how our part's going to behave. And now there's examples in the past where residual stress hasn't been considered, but in actual fact, it's, it's turned out to be a benefit um, to, to the manufacturer. Back in the early 1900s, the French artillery um, would manufacture gun barrels. Part of their routine manufacturing process um, was to stress test. So they'd apply, you know, a, a given stress level, apply a hydrostatic pressure, um, and if the parts passed, then they'd go into service. Well, what happened in this case is some of them were accidentally overstressed to, to a much higher um, pressure than intended. Rather than scrap these parts, they thought, you know, well, they're fine, we'll, we'll put them in service um, and see what happens. And in actual fact, these parts perform better um, than the standard, the standard barrels. The reason was compressive residual stress. When they'd overstressed that inner bore um, of the gun barrel, they'd accidentally introduced residual stress. And that was a fatigue sort of sensitive part um, of the component and in actual fact um, increased its lifetime. Unfortunately, it's not always good. Um, if we don't consider residual stress, bad things can happen. And an unfortunate example of this would be the Silver Bridge in Ohio in 1967. So this bridge had actually stood for decades, seemingly fine, until one day a crack in a single eye bar caused the bridge to collapse, um, sadly causing the death of 46 people. And upon investigation, it was found that 
The reason for this failure was residual stress, which had caused a crack to propagate and then grow, um, and eventually for the beam to fail. So it's for reasons like this that when we're talking about situations where people's lives could be at risk, um, that we need to consider residual stress. And it's one of the reasons why um, industries such as the nuclear industry, the aerospace industry, where we have safety critical components, they have been early adopters of residual stress research. Um, not just the problems it can cause, but the benefits that, that can be exploited from it. And I think this is something that we'll see across more and more industries um, as we go into the future. So fatigue. Fatigue is defined really as the number of times a component can be subjected to a given load. So if we take something like a gear or a turbine blade or a shaft, if we know what the loading conditions are going to be, we can work out how long that part is going to last in service. However, if we add in a tensile residual stress, then we're effectively increasing the load on the material as metallic materials typically fail under tension. So when we add this in, it can go to effectively reduce you know, the lifetime of the part significantly in some cases. And this is fine, but it's important that we understand the presence of these stresses if we're going to accurately understand uh, the lifetime of the, the material. Of course, this can be a benefit as well. Um, we can use the compressive residual stresses on things like the, the shot pin gears or shot pin blades, things like this. It's also the reason why we can have glass screens that are as large and perform as well um, as they do today. Glass screens on phones would typically fracture um, at a much higher rate um, if it wasn't for the fact that they're treated in a way to give compressive residual stress on the surface of the glass. So they might still crack but that crack isn't going to propagate through the entire screen like it would if it was otherwise treated. Distortion. Distortion is a huge problem across sort of many industries, whether we're talking sort of high volume, low cost manufacture to very high value manufacturing. Distortion causes problems across the world and costs millions and millions and millions of pounds um, of scrap. Take a high value application, for example, we could have a, po a component that we have poured tens of thousands of pounds worth of material, worth of effort, worth of man hours into, only for it to be scrapped at the very final stage due to distortion caused by unchecked residual stress. And this distortion comes from that self equilibrating nature that I'd mentioned previously. Throughout the part, all the stresses have to add up to zero. Otherwise, a part would be moving. So if we then remove some material, then we're removing the stress as well that existed within that region of the material. The part then has to redistribute all those internal stresses in order to maintain an equilibrium. In doing so, this redistribution can quite often cause the material to yield. You know, we get plastic deformation and the part is permanently deformed. As you can see here in that sort of highly deformed sheet uh, component. So, residual stresses are obviously very important. I hope I've got that across to you. But they're not a standalone topic when we're considering the thermal mechanical processing of a part. When we're taking a component and looking at how it's going to perform um, during manufacture and then in service, it's a combination of the material type, the residual stress, microstructure, mechanical properties, all of these things. And we can't really just consider one in isolation as the evolution of residual stress throughout manufacturing is quite likely going to affect the evolution of microstructure or the evolution of the properties. So it's important when we're looking, um, when we're studying residual stress, when we're seeing how how to evolve the residual stress throughout the manufacturing process, we consider sort of all these different characteristics. I'm going to talk now about our approach 
to residual stress research um, here at the AFRC. I think I'd describe this as a bit of a holistic approach. So the origins of residual stress research would be measurement. You know, we, we measure parts, we see what the stress is and we deal with it, you know, as, as we need to. But really there's there's somewhat of a of a life cycle when we're talking about how to to deal with residual stress um, and how that um, works in manufacturing. So the first step I'll start with is prediction. If we can accurately predict residual stress, then we don't need to measure it. We can save ourselves the time and effort of going and physically measuring it. But of course, that's not that's not realistic in all cases. Um, and often we do need measurement. Um, and this is that the vast majority or a large amount of what we do at AFRC is measurement and um, for a whole a uh, whole range of reasons that I'll get on to. Management. So we can predict our stress, we can measure our stress to, to ensure that we have what we think we have. We then need to decide how to deal with this. Do we just accept the stresses for what they are? Do we look to change the stresses or do we look to control our manufacturing process in order to give us a more favourable uh, residual stress distribution? And these really are cyclical. Um, a, a good approach to controlling residual stress, you know, within your component, you know, we'll, we'll look upon each of these areas. So prediction. This is a key tool that we use and engineers use and designers will use um, to avoid you know undesirable effects of residual stress. It's not always feasible to measure you know every single point of every single part. Um, so it's important that we're able to make a prediction for what sort of levels of stress we're expecting um, and so what of our what our problem areas are going to be. So the FRC we predict the residual stress using modeling tools. Um, such as finite element analysis, and this could be process models, microstructural models, inverse analysis. It's there's a whole range of tools available depending on the manufacturing process we're looking at. To touch sort of on the material science side of things, this type of modeling really isn't possible unless we fully understand what our material is doing. We need to understand how our material behaves during these forming processes if we're going to predict residual stress. It's not enough just to know a stress strain curve or just to know, you know, a, a yield stress and a Young's modulus. We need to understand what our manufacturing process is doing. And we need sort of time dependent, temperature dependent, strain dependent data if we're going to accurately predict um, the residual stress, the results in a part. And we have the facilities at AFRC, you know, to, to do this sort of thermal mechanical simulation and um, physical simulation of materials to get this sort of data. And of course, whenever we have a modeling program, this will typically be paired with a measurement program. There's no point predicting something if we can't prove that our predictions are accurate. And I think that's that's something to import, something important to consider um, with, with residual stress modeling in general is we always want to validate our our models, you know, with with some real experimental data. So the sort of modeling we do will cover, you know, microstructural models. It will be process models for forming, for forging, for all the different manufacturing processes we have in the center, for all the, the sort of subsequent operations like heat treatment and machining, we can predict what effect these are going to have um, on our materials and then some more sort of specialist uh, applications like welding or dissimilar joining. So residual stress measurement, this is something that comes up in essentially every residual stress project, you know, any, any work that we're doing measurement is is typically on the table and there's a huge range of techniques available to decide like what is the best way to measure the part and it's not a straightforward answer the measurement the best measurement for the job is going to be dependent on what material are we working with what's the geometry and where are we looking to get stresses from can we destroy the part do we want to measure the part multiple times throughout the the manufacturing process you know, how much time and budget do we have? 
do we need to adhere to a standard, for example, um, in the nuclear industry? So we have options, destructive methods like the contour method or slitting, semi-destructive methods like uh, electronic spec speckle pattern interferometry and hole drilling, or we can do XRD with material removal. And then the, the typical non-destructive methods, um, XRD, ultrasonic, neutron. And we have a, a large number of these here at the AFRC, um, as we can see in the green here. And there's other um, techniques available to us, you know, located throughout the UK. So moving on to management or mitigation of residual stresses. So it's quite often desirable not just to accept and measure the residual stresses as they are, but we want to change them. We might want to introduce um, compressive stresses or we might want to reduce the overall level of stresses for distortion. And there's multiple options for how we can do this. Probably the most common and the most famous is thermal. You know, we, you put something in an oven. There's chemical methods, mechanical methods, and probably less well known vibratory and acoustic methods. And I'll come on to each of these um, in turn. So thermal, that's probably the most widely applied stress relief technology. This it, it typically involves putting a part in a furnace and we increase the temperature um, until the stress is relieved. And this is achieved because as metals are heated up, their yield stress drops and um, eventually will reach a level where the yield stress matches the residual stress of the part and the stresses are relaxed. And then we can then decide how we want to cool the part, whether slowly to, to maintain a low stress condition or quickly if we need a certain microstructure or residual stress. But that's the sort of the basics uh, of thermal stress relief. Very common, very widely applied, not useful in all in all um, situations. For example, if we want to maintain um, some microstructural features um, that are left over uh, from a, from an earlier process, so we need other options on the table. A quite specific, um, quite specific so aspect of, of the thermal side is sort of moving away from heat as an option to to cold as an option and this is this is quite personal to me this this was some of the work i did earlier in my career um, and to similar joints we have a problem of, of high stresses developing um, as parts expand and contract we get stresses develop at the interface and that's just a reality of, of the similar joints so what we can do to actually to to overcome this is to use to use heat in a different way we cool things down um, so they're very cold and we basically reverse the typical expansion sort of contraction relationship that we see. And this can relieve stresses, it can give us more beneficial um, residual stress states. Mechanical methods. So this um, is what I was talking about earlier with the gun barrel, um, where we apply a pressure in order to exceed the yield stress, we then remove the pressure and we get elastic recovery, which gives us the residual stresses that we want. And this is the same, um, the same sort of uh, fundamentals that we see in things like cold work and cold rolling. We're forcing material to move beyond its yield point. And then when we remove that external force, whether it's pressure or whether it's a roller, the part relaxes and stresses are either relieved or opposite to what they were before. Something that's became a, a real focus at the, the AFRC and NMIS is vibratory stress relief or acoustic stress relief. So in some instances, we may have a part that we can't put in a furnace, you know, it's materials that aren't suitable for thermal stress relief or it's too big are too expensive to put in a, a typical furnace and cold work isn't an option. In this instance, something like vibratory stress relief um, could be the answer. So here we are basically vibrating a part either globally in the case of vibratory stress relief or locally in the case of acoustic or ultrasonic stress relief. 
and this causes dislocation movement, which, which causes a relaxation and residual stress. So this is particularly useful for large parts, heavy parts, the similar material joints, um, large fabrications, you know, additive manufactured parts, and we avoid um, the problems that can be associated with heat treatment. So this is a technology that's commonly applied prior to machining. So this is this has existed for decades and decades, and particularly over in the States, and it's been used not directly to reduce residual stresses per se, but to reduce distortion that occurs during machining. And the reason that there's less distortion is because stresses have been relieved. Exciting technology and something that needs a lot more research um, and something that we're working on um, quite often here at the centre. Just some examples of the, the, the VSR I'm talking about. These are sort of large toolings, machine tools, fabrications, um, things that are typically quite difficult to stress relieve. If we don't want to just relieve our stresses, you know, ra rather than being uh, reacting to, to what stresses are there, we can take a different approach and we can try and control the residual stresses in the first place. So rather than manufacture a part as we always have done and then try and, you know, stress relieve the part and um, using the annealing, we could change our process to actually give us more favourable stresses in the first place. Examples of this could be controlling the heating and cooling, you know, during thermal operations and then optimising your ageing or your stress relief afterwards. It could be controlling the path and the conditions used during additive manufacturing. It could be altering the tool path and the sequence of machining. Um, for example, if you've got high residual stresses or experiencing distortion. And it could be through selection of you know, specific materials or alloys that give us more favourable residual stresses in the first place, while still satisfying whatever the requirements are of the component. An example of this would be some of the work we've done here at AFRC, where if we were to machine this part, we can see, um, which is quite highly stressed, it is going to move about um, because of these residual stresses. But if we intelligently decide our machining schedule, we can control that distortion and have the final shape match what we want. So I'll talk quickly now about some of the, the capability that we have at the centre and then just finish up with some case studies. So I've talked about residual stress measurement and the importance so of that sort of life cycle, the control, the management, the prediction, all of it feeds back to measurement in some way or another. It could be to validate a, a model, a process model, a microstructural model. It could be to ensure product conformance in a, a safety critical application. It could be to try and solve a problem. And this is something that we see all the time in the centre. Uh, uh, a manufacturing company is having a problem with a part that's distorting or a part that's cracking or it's it's moving about once it's in service. Um, so residual stress is, is an obvious candidate and, and we'll turn to measurement. Or it could be to actually evaluate how effective one manufacturing parameter is versus another. Could be shot peening or, or heat treatment processes, or it could just be forming and forging processes. How do these affect residual stress? And we can sort of design that process um, by measuring the, the stresses themselves. To satisfy this, we've developed a whole suite of, of measurement capabilities um, covering the, the near surface, bulk methods, all sorts of destructive and non-destructive um, and sort of measurements that sort of satisfy whether it's quality demands, time demands or cost demands. On the, the surface sort of level, we've got X-ray diffraction. So this um, relies on the interaction um, of different different crystals in, in the material and um, we'll get a, ref, uh, a spacing between different uh, crystals and we can measure what that spacing is and how that changes due to strain or residual stress in the part. Coal drilling, so this is something that you'll have seen 
um, possibly you know over, over the course of decades this has been used in aerospace and power generation for years and years very reliable sort of very accurate and we're measuring the stress by drilling a hole in a part and seeing how it relaxes a more modern take on this would be esbi hole drilling whereby we don't apply a strain gauge but we measure the displacement using um, optical methods but the premise is exactly the same The contour method, so this is when we're starting to look more in the bulk of material. And this is quite a new method. It was invented in about 2001. Um, it's based on Buckner's superposition principle um, for any fracture mechanics people out there. And it's a very powerful method um, for mapping stresses in engineering structures. The premise behind it is we can take a part, we can cut it in half, and the part's going to deform. By measuring that surface deformation, that surface contour, we can calculate what stresses it would take to force it back to a flat condition. And that essentially gives us the residual stress in the part. The method consists of clamping a part, uh, cutting it using EDM, measuring the surface using a CMM or, or optical methods. We then apply our contour method evaluation um, and finally, some, some finite element analysis. So here, in a, a sort of disk type component, we can see it's been sectioned by EDM. We then measure that cut surface, and we can calculate that whole residual stress field. So sort of getting this sort of density of data would, would take a long time using other methods. Ultrasonic is a method where it's completely non-destructive. Um, the speed of sound um, in a material is a given value, and this changes if that part is stressed. So we can theoretically measure the stress in a part using ultrasonic methods. And this is some work that we're doing at, at the AFRC to try and develop this. It's non-destructive, fully portable, and has um, real upside um, for introducing it into manufacturing. <laughs> So yeah, this, this just kind of covers that there, where more development is needed, but the potential for in situ inline measurements um, is extremely high. And it's something I can see being in, in manufacturing, you know, in, in decades to come. So I'll move on to just some, some case studies briefly where, where we've seen where we've seen this. So I mean we work with a whole range um, of companies here at AFRC whether it's our, our tier one members and partners like Rolls Royce, down to other research organisations, to local uh, local SMEs and local manufacturers. And this will sort of cover the whole range of uh, just measurement projects to understanding, you know, actual manufacturing processes through a larger programme um, of residual stress analysis. An example of this would be McTaggart Scott. So this is a, a local company who manufacture uh, a range of components for sort of naval and defence. And in this case, it was cam rings that we we're talking about. So they were having the problem where cam rings were cracking. Um, they came to the FRC, and we did a, a thorough examination of the evolution um, of residual stress throughout the manufacturing process. I say we, it was it was Janice who I think we have on the call today. Um, and so we studied how the residual stress changed after all different manufacturing processes, after heat treatments, after machining, um, what the input condition was like. Um, and we were actually, in the end, able to help McTaggart Scott streamline their process by understanding what effect each process was having. This resulted in a three-day reduction in lead time, reduction in energy consumption, um, and in a two-day uh, reduction in production time. So I, I saw we have uh, Stephen Halliday on on today. Debbie, is, is Stephen going to be joining in? Do you know, or or will I uh, will I cover this? I'll cover this for now. So Rolls Royce. Um, 
So, so Dave here, uh, Steve here. Yeah, you just just you cover the um, the case study. I can take any questions offline, but um, if you if you run through it yourself, that's fine. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. So, for those that are unfamiliar, Rolls Royce are one of the, the founding members um, of the AFRC. Uh, we have a long and successful history of of all sorts of research projects, but in spe uh, specifically research projects. Um, one such project um, was nominated and was a finalist for the, the Engineer uh, Collaborate to Innovate Awards. And this was a sort of very interesting um, project looking at using residual stress measurement to understand um, different manufacturing processes and the effect that they have uh, on, on uh, the, the final part. And there's details of that sort of available in a case study on our website. To go into sort of some more specifics, um, on a different project we had um, as part of the Mammoth Power Gearbox program, uh, we did some sort of very interesting work on looking at improving the fatigue performance um, of gears. Again, all this information is available um, on our website and, and in some papers uh, that I've published, you can see down at the bottom. So this was a multi-centre, multidisciplinary project that, that covered all sorts of things. But one aspect of it was looking at different forming, different forging conditions and the effect that this would have on not just residual stress, but on distortion. And uh, there was some, some really interesting sort of results came out of that. Finally, uh, a more sort of detailed uh, case study here is really, so this is my own work that I did at, at, um, at the FRC. And I think this is a good example of all the different aspects um, of, of residual stress that I've discussed today being utilised in a research project. So nuclear fusion has the potential to help solve uh, the world's energy crisis. Uh, achieving this is going to require pushing materials and manufacturing far beyond what's currently possible. And one of the specific challenges here is to create a material system where you can harness the, the extreme heat that's created. So we're, we're talking 150 million degrees in, in the centre of, of this reaction and materials are, at, are going to be exposed to maybe 3000 degrees, which is far beyond what we see in, say, you know, conventional nuclear, um, nuclear power. To do this, we need to dissimilar, dissimilarly join um, extremely temperature dependent material like tungsten to some really sort of functional materials and this as I've mentioned earlier is going to cause residual stresses because the parts are so different when you add in heat and dissimilar materials they expand and contract differently and introduce very high um, interface stresses and so what my project did and there's I, I can talk about this with anyone that's interested or you know there's, there's papers out there was take um, this problem basically through that whole process that I've discussed today. So we did um, materials characterization to really understand what the material was doing right down to the micro level, you know, on the sort of micron scale. We modeled what the residual stresses were going to be, modeled the, the thermal process, the dissimilar joining and how stresses evolve. And then characterise those stresses using a whole range of measurement techniques like contour method and XRD. Realise that the stresses we have aren't what I'd like them to be. So then implement um, a residual stress management method. So the thermal autofrotage where we use liquid nitrogen to change what the residual stress state is. And then going back through that process, predicting what the change will be measuring what the change was and so on and so forth. So I think this is a good example of how you can take a problem through that entire sort of research life cycle. And that's all for me today. Thank you for listening. Um, I've seen some questions pop up, so I'm looking forward to, to addressing them. Thanks, guys. Okay, Stuart, that's your microphone on. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, okay, thank you, David, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm sure everyone will have found it interesting and insightful. Um, we've got some time, uh, about 10 minutes or so.
uh, to cover some of the questions that have been coming in uh, from from uh, uh, our participants today. Um, so I think I will just uh, get started on that and um, go into the first question, which is relating to um, a question relating to how do we measure residual stresses um, for a small 70 millimeter uh, cubes um, and, and what equipment is available on the market for this type of measurement? Okay, so 70 millimeter cubes. I mean, it's going to depend where we're interested in the, the stresses there. 70 millimeter is, is large enough that we're not really ruling out, you know, any of, of the options we've got. If I, I mean, without knowing more details, I would advise something like we do x-ray diffraction, you know, on the surface. Um, x-ray diffraction is a very accurate method. Um, it's, it's accredited with 17025 and we could be very confident in those results. We would then move on to something like ESBI hole drilling. So that would take us from the sort of 10 micron depth that we get with XRD down to, you know, about a millimetre or so. And then we would use the contour method. So, yeah, 70 millimetres is is quite small, but it's it's definitely viable with, with the contour method and we could get those sort of through thickness stresses um, as I showed earlier. Okay, thank you, David. Um, next question we have uh, is is relating to um, brittle crack propagation. Um, okay. The question is, uh, is, is brittle crack propagation due to residual stresses present in manufacturing? And, and if yes, there's a two-parter, David. If yes, what is the importance and what are the applications uh, that can be affected? It certainly can be. Um, yeah, brittle crack propagation, you know, can be a, a, a product of residual stress, um, especially uh, as it's sort of alluded to in, in a sort of tensile region, um, any brittle material that we, we start to get that crack propagation, you know, is, is going to suffer greatly. Um, could you repeat part two of the question? Uh, so part two is, if yes, then what is the importance um, and what are the applications that could be affected? Okay, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult to say just in, in general terms, but the, the importance of, of residual stress in that case, obviously, is very high. It's going to depend on, you know, what the material is, what the operating conditions, there's, there's all these factors, you know, to say whether residual stress is, you know, the, the dominant factor here or not. Um, but I'd suspect that it is important and that some of the considerations I'd mentioned earlier and how we can improve what well, I'd mentioned fatigue, but it could be brittle factor brittle fracture, we could improve the the defence against that through, you know, beneficial modification of residual stress. Thanks, David. I think I think uh, one of the important things that um, I'm, I, I'm looking at some of the other questions um, that we have, um, we, we're probably going to say the words a lot, it depends. Um, yes. and, and that's really important because uh, there, there isn't necessarily a one uh, one size fits all um, approach to um, residual stress, particularly, but but many many um, you know material science uh, uh, applications um, and, and questions, um, and and that's why it's so important uh, to be able to engage with. Uh, uh, people like David and, and specialist centres like uh, the AFRC um, so that uh, you can access uh, the, the wide experience um, that that our uh, researchers and engineers have in terms of the application of these various tools. Okay. Oh, thanks, Stuart. <laughs> I, than I, could say. I think uh, we, we've got another one and this one's about shot peening. Okay. Um, and it's uh, shot peening can improve high cycle fatigue durability significantly. But yes. is there any evidence that this can decrease 
performance with very high cycle fatigue, say greater than 1 billion cycles, due to overall increased stress in the material? Good question. Um, yeah, very good question. I couldn't say definitively. I guess, I mean, I, I could absolutely see that being the case, um, particularly if if the peening process you've used wasn't, you know, optimised for the stress levels that, that you're expecting, which are going to be pretty low if we're talking, you know, ultra high cycle. Um, then, yeah, I mean, factors such as, you know, the introduction of, of any damage or micro cracks or anything during the peening process itself could outweigh uh, the you know the benefit but yeah again i, I couldn't say definitively um i Thank mean you. on on paper if if your compressive stress you know is is high enough and the this your applied load is is low enough um, to be below your endurance limit then it it shouldn't have an effect but uh, I, I couldn't say for sure okay thanks david Next question, um, you showed a picture of uh, a gear indicating uh, an EDM cut for the contour method yes. and further cut for bending. Yes. Can you talk through the implications of applying more than one destructive test method on a single part? Yes. So the assumption when we're doing contour method measurements and the cuts is that you know, we're dealing with a fully elastic release of stresses, um, and that that's that's why we do uh, the EDM cut, and that's why the, the clamping is so important, so that we can approximate uh, an elastic cut. As long as we maintain that, you know, elastic regime of stress release, we can, you know, we can add and, and subtract stresses together. So when we are taking the bending moment cut, and um, we can measure, you know, what stresses are released from that cut, provided these are all elastic. We can then calculate what the stress release was, you know, at, at the point where the contour cut's going to be, and they can just be added, you know, arithmetically. Um, so that's that's just one of the, the, the principles of, of superposition when we're talking elastic stresses. So one, one of the sources of, of error that could come into contour method would be if you didn't do either of those cuts properly and you introduced plasticity, uh, that is going to introduce sort of errors into your results. Okay, thank you, David. And I think I'm just checking our time here. I think we've probably got one more, we've got time for one more um, question. And this one's regarding modelling. Um, and it says, modelling is one of the key aspects of dealing with residual stresses. What is the current standard in the industrial environment? I think, again, that's a, it's a, a depends question. The, the standard is going to vary um, greatly depend on what industry we're talking um, and what materials we're talking with. Um, there are some industries, aerospace industries, where, you know, the, the modelling is probably more advanced. Um, we're able to model uh, a microstructural level, the sort of changes that we're seeing in the material um, throughout whatever the, the manufacturing process is and correlate that to um, to the residual stress. It's, it's not always the case. Like, I mean, when we're talking and just with the technologies we have in the centre, we could look at forging, which is advanced, the state of the art of modelling there is advanced in terms of predicting residual stress. But we could look at some of the other incremental technologies where the, the state of the art of the modelling, you know, isn't sufficient to, to give us an accurate prediction of residual stress, things like flow forming or spinning. Um, the, the specifics on the modelling approach are used, you know, the type of models we're using is going to change based on what we're looking at. Um, but in general, things like forging um, is very advanced and, and some of the other processes is less so. Okay, that's great. Thank you, David. Okay, well, um, 
I'm afraid that's us uh, out of time, but I'd just like to say well, thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, and I hope that you have enjoyed our webinar and found the content and subject matter to have been interesting and uh, hopefully useful. Uh, if you have any further questions um, or you would like to discuss any potential project work with us, please get in touch with either myself or David um, using our email addresses that are uh, shown on screen. Okay. Thank okay. you, Stuart. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. I'll just let the comments run for a few more seconds in case anybody has anything else to say. And then I'll let you know when I'm closing down the meeting. Sure.